Sanergy aims to make sanitation sustainable in urban slums by making, by making it hygienic, accessible, and affordable. Starting with the slums of Kenya, where 8 million people resort to open defecation and the practice known as flying toilets, we are taking a systems-based approach. We are building a den dense network of low-cost sanitation facilities distributed throughout the slums. Each sanitation facility is owned and operated by a local who can run it as a viable business. Then, we collect the waste on a daily basis through our network of waste collectors, and they take the waste to a centralized location where we convert it into useful byproducts such as electricity, fertilizer, and biogas. In five years, we're aiming to serve 500,000 people through a network of 5,000 toilets. We've chosen to start in Kenya both because there's a high need, which can make a high market demand for high quality sanitation, and also because it's a great market for the byproducts that we can make from waste. Both the, there's an electricity shortage here in Kenya, as well as um, uh, negligible domestic fertilizer production, which means that farmers in East Africa pay twice the global average price for fertilizer. Everyone who has played a part in raising me has always said, you know, that it's, it's just that, that, that I'm in a situation where I, I can give back and I can help in society. And they've always, and they've always led by example through that. In uh, 2006, I came back from teaching in China for two years and we had a family reunion. And I went to the family reunion and there were about 70 family members there and not a single person was actually working for a, a, a for-profit corporation. Uh, every single person was actually working I, in some way towards a social mission, uh, either, either as an educator or as a public servant. And you know, it really got me thinking that, what I, that where I come from, my great-grandparents are actually missionaries in China, is one that my background is, is driven by the by family members who are fighting for social justice social justice and you know one thing that I've learned just throughout my my travels working for the Clinton Foundation and companies like Endeavor which help for-profit entrepreneurs is that economic justice can be married with social justice from the, when I was four years old through high school I went to the same school it's called the Galloway School in Atlanta Georgia and some people in the city might think of it as the hippie high school, the hippie school of Atlanta. But the core philosophy of my school throughout my entire life was a focus on developing an intense love of learning and developing a community of lifelong learners. And I thoroughly absorbed and subscribed to that philosophy. And I think it that's what really started me on my path from college onward of really being interested in tough challenges um, and as part of that it, community is a big part of that as well so challenges and how do you tackle challenges that help build community and a belief that community really sustains people there's a real difference between what a community needs and what a community wants uh, it's very simple to say that people need sanitation but that doesn't mean that they're going to use the toilet that you provide them with. That you know, me, you know, they've been spending their whole lives going a certain way, and so you know, introducing a different model um, takes takes some adapting to, and and so you know, in technical terms, we call this demand generation and how we're going to create a community of people who are eager to use our toilets. Um, and, you know, that requires us to be very, you know, use all of our senses and think about what's going on in, in the communities that we're serving. But also, having the community become the, the greatest champions for, for, san, for sanitation change. Um, and that's a process that we're learning right now. There's a tremendous amount of, of, of patience and uh, positivity and creativity, I would say. Um, and then, uh, and then the next challenge is, you know, how do we distribute these toilets? So we, we definitely had one clear idea in our mind about entrepreneurs being the ones who own and operate these for themselves. But we've quickly learned that schools and restaurants and churches often want to use these as, you know, a value-add service. It's like, this is why we are a better school. 
Um, another thing we've learned about is how landlords uh, can buy these for their tenants, um, and this is something tenants will pay greater rent for. This is stuff that we didn't really know um, when we began, and realizing these these uh, realizing these, which I think at first were you know potentially problems, like we just because we didn't know what how we were going to weigh it all up, have become opportunities. The woman, I would guess she's probably in her 40s, um, lived in the slum of Matare, lived there her whole adult life. She was really excited about this energy solution, both as a potential consumer and as a potential operator. So as a consumer, she really was driving home that the fact that at night, most women will not leave their homes to use the toilet or for any other reason. It's really just not safe. Um, and in fact, Women and children are a particular harm for violence and especially sexual assault in that commute basically to and from the toilet at night. Um, and so she was so excited about the idea of having a small toilet that would be able to be located really close to homes that she wouldn't have to make that you know, a long journey at night but could just step right outside of her door um, when she needs to use the bathroom. Pretty simple uh, in our world. And then as an operator, which I hadn't thought about it as much, she just really impressed upon me that women in the slums have very few um, opportunities to earn an income. The two main things that they can do, uh, one is run a kiosk or some other sort of small retail or service business within the slum. So maybe they um, sew clothes, more often they probably sell vegetables in a market, something like that. Um, and their income opportunities are actually cut for things like that or, or cut shorter because they actually have to come later and leave earlier uh, due to daylight hours because of their need to access sanitation when it's light out. Um, the other main thing that they do to earn income is to work as domestic help in the homes of middle class residents of Nairobi. And I never heard someone speak so poignantly about the dangers in that line of work. Um, that while you know most people, I'm sure, are um, very responsible employers, there are all too many stories of the dangers that women can face in having to leave their homes every single day um, to go work in another person's home. And so the danger is commuting to or working in those homes. And she was so excited about the opportunities that Synergy Toilets would bring for herself and other women to, to work, to own and operate those um, and generate a, a solid, sustainable income in their own communities. Our favorite character is this a kid named Alan who was about 10 years old and he was at the school where one of our pilots is in the slum known as Lunga Lunga. Or he had been going to school for just a couple of years and didn't speak any English when he began but over over time he'd gone to the top of the class as, as the lead English speaker and he quickly became the ambassador for all the other students who are mostly younger than him um, who were mostly younger than him, and, and he was just blowing us away with not only, you know, his ability to communicate the importance of sanitation, but also how he was reprimanding the younger students on how to properly use the toilet, and that they shouldn't throw rocks and, and into the toilets, and that they, you know, that they should form a line, and things like that. And it, it did also, you know, for me, it like struck home the fact that working with kids is actually really important, because you know, they're the ones who, I mean, you know, if you really think about how long it's going to take to change change the face of sanitation, I mean, these kids are going to grow up very quickly. And, and, and teaching them early about the importance of hygienic sanitation, um, as embodied by uh, Alan, really showed me how important uh, our work was in schools. One of the things that we really try to do at Synergy, and is definitely something that is a core principle of my last employer, uh, Google, is launch and iterate. That we, so last summer, uh, some of our team members were here in Nairobi and built two prototypes, essentially, two kind of proof of concepts to, sh to show that we can build the toilet that we're planning to build um, using local materials at the price points that we said we could hit. Um, and then found the right partners to be able to test those out in the community in, in two different areas in Nairobi. They're not perfect toilets. The operations for them are, you know, are not running perfectly, but if you don't take that chance of putting out uh, an imperfect product, you're not going to learn 
how to make it better, um, and you're not going to be able to get the feedback and start to get people to really believe in you that you can make a better product. So I think one really universal thing in any business, and particularly in an entrepreneurial venture, is to the, the critical importance of launching early and often and then rapidly iterating on that. I think it's really important to, um, ha to work with people that you really enjoy working with and you know who can join you on your journey because being an entrepreneur alone I think is very very lonely um, you know you're gonna face a lot of rejection uh, people telling you that your idea is, is, is not good it's too crazy it sucks and for us uh, I think you know working as a team with you know we have working with a team that's now as, as big as 12 people and we all just like get along incredibly well and you know that gives us a lot of motivation uh, I think when when things get difficult um, and things always do get difficult and I guess I guess one thing I would add is I this a few months ago I read uh, Tony Shea's uh, the founder of Zappos book on happiness and it really it really set an impressive tone for me about what I should be thinking about as a leader and I recommend that to uh, anyone out there one thinker who really influences me is a guy named Paul Polak, who wrote this book called Out of Poverty. And what it really focuses on is the fact that if you take all of the designs in the world for all products, basically it's being they are basically being designed for the 10% who are the richest in the world. And so how do you actually design products for the 90% of people who, you know, by and large are, are not being thought of? Um, and, and in many ways this is like, you know, how do you do a bottoms-up approach to design and then subsequently to development? Um, and I just think that, you know, especially in today's era where, where we're always saying, oh, how, how can we apply that technology to help the poor? You know, that, that might not always be the right question to be asking. It, instead, the question should be, you know, what do the poor want? And how can we how can we be effective servants in that regard? How um, challenging, but really, really important it is to for everybody to figure out how to work globally. And often today, I think that's put into a lot of technological solutions. Um, and when those solutions work, they certainly make things more helpful. Things like you know, Skype and things that. Uh, we sometimes struggle with here, depending our, on our own uh, phone and internet access. Um, but, but more than technology, I guess I really mean figuring out how do you make sure that you are not starting from your own cultural assumptions in just communicating even the most basic requests and asking the most basic questions. Um, and it, it's been a real challenge, I think, in making sure that we are talking with our potential customers and potential operators um, in ways that are effective in getting us the information that we need um, and sharing with them the, the ideas that we have. Uh, so I don't have any grand solution for how we do that, but I think it's at a starting place is for everybody when working globally to really think, to be particularly cognizant of that the, my own assumptions and, and the question that I'm asking is going to sound different to the person to whom I'm asking it mm -hmm. um, and really stepping back to try to strip it down to be as explicit as possible not because the person you're talking to can understand things any less well but they don't they're not coming from the same starting place in terms of background and assumptions